The first, first gospel reading today comes from John chapter 12, verses 12 through 16. The next day the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel! Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. The second reading this morning comes from the book of Mark, chapter 11, verses 1 through 11. When they were approaching Jerusalem at Bethage and Bethany, near the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the village ahead of you, and immediately as you enter, you will find tied there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone asks you, Why are you doing this? Just say this. The Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found the colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, Why are you, What are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. They brought the colt to Jesus and threw their cloaks on it, and he sat on it. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, and others spread the leafy branches that they had cut in the fields. Then those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. Hosanna in the highest. Then he entered Jerusalem and went to the temple. And when he had looked around at everything, as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. Please bow your heads as I say a prayer for the preacher. Lord, as we near the celebration of your ultimate gift to all of us, may we not forget the journey that to the cross and all the suffering that came with it. Bless Pastor Bill today and open our hearts to hear and understand his message. May it bring us closer to you. Please continue to bless Pastor Terry as she prepares to rejoin us even briefly, after her sabbatical. Let her know that we are eager to have her amongst us again. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Probably going to be a short sermon, because every other Sunday I've been here, Jackie's told me what to say, and today she didn't, so I'm not sure what to say today. <laughs> and the reason the rocks have a hole in them is for the leash. For the what? The leash. Oh, yes. For your pet rock. I don't know what she's talking about. I wasn't around as long as you had been around in 1975. We'll just say, we'll leave it at that. So this man bought a donkey from a preacher. He was very excited to get this donkey. He went to pick it up, and the preacher was explaining some of the um, instructions about this donkey. He said, now, since this donkey was owned by me, a preacher, it has some special commands that it will only obey. So if you want it to go, you have to say hallelujah. And if you want it to stop, you have to say amen. Well, the man was kind of excited about that. So he climbed up on the donkey, and he said hallelujah, and the donkey began to trot. And then he said amen, and the donkey stopped suddenly. And so he paid the preacher, and he went on his way with a hallelujah. And so he was traveling for some time, and he was traveling through the mountains. And as you know, you need a donkey if you're going to be traveling through the mountains. And as he was traveling through the mountains, he was getting closer and closer to the edge of the cliff. And he couldn't remember the command to get the donkey to stop. Stop, said the man. Halt! He said nothing was working. Then he, then he remembered, oh, yeah, that's right. It, 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 it's a holy word. Um, so he yelled church and then Bible. Then he got very desperate and he said, please stop. And the donkey kept getting closer and closer to the edge of the cliff. 
So the man in desperation began to pray. Dear Lord, please make this donkey stop before I go off the edge of this mountain. In Jesus' name, amen. And the donkey immediately stopped right on the edge of the cliff, and the man said, hallelujah. <laughs> That's got nothing to do with the sermon, but there's not often that you can find a joke about a donkey that you can tell in church. So get to back to what to, to about the sermon. So this procession into Jerusalem, both as we heard in the Gospel of John and a very different version from the Gospel of Mark, these are this is a very public moment in Jesus' ministry, and some have called it a brilliant act of political theater. Jesus is entering Jerusalem, and undoubtedly he is coming in surrounded by the same crowd that he had been associating with all of his ministry. He had been connecting with the sinners and the possessed and the sick and the blind and women and foreigners. And so here they are processing into Jerusalem, and I'm sure that those respectable people that were in the town were just laughing at the sight that they were seeing. But what a day it must have been. I mean, I can imagine it was probably kind of a mix between a carnival and Mardi Gras and a little bit of a parade and somewhat of a circus. Hundreds and thousands of Jews were jammed into the holiest of holy cities. Hundreds of thousands of pilgrims were jammed into those narrow little streets, shoulder to shoulder, arm to arm, body to body. It's like $5 bag day at the Thrifty Penny. You couldn't walk. You couldn't squeeze through. This mob of people crammed into tiny, narrow streets. It was Passover, and the city was packed. And people had come out to see this Jesus enter because his reputation went before him. It was just the day before that Jesus produced the mightiest of miracles he had ever done. He raised a man from the dead. Just the day before, he raised Lazarus from the dead, and then as he was entering in Jerusalem, he healed two blind men who were now able to see. And so the mass of the people had heard about this miracle worker, and they wanted to see the healer in action for themselves. Because if they did, if they saw a miracle, if they saw someone raised from the dead, then certainly they would believe. But underlying all of this, Mark brings up a very important question. Why are you doing this? I think it's a question we can ask of Jesus. It's a question that was asked of the disciples. I believe it's even a question we ask of ourselves. I vividly remember the first time I ever asked myself that question. It was my senior year in college. In addition to my studies and my social life, I had several jobs because I was trying to finish paying for school. At the time, I was the prestigious dishroom manager because I got five cents more an hour than everybody else, and I didn't have to wash dishes anymore. I also ran the cash register at our student union. I worked for our theater department, but my junior year, I landed my dream job that I started the fall of my senior year. I got to work for campus security. I, I got a walkie-talkie and everything because I was so excited because this is what I thought I'd be doing. I knew on Friday nights and Saturday nights a member of the a student member of uh, campus security sat in the women's dorm lobby, and as women were coming in from a night, they were there to make sure that they arrived safely, or if some if a young lady needed to be walked back to her dorm, the campus student campus security guard would walk them back to their dorm. I thought, what a great way to meet girls. So that's what I thought I was gonna do. Here's what I actually did. From Saturday night until Sunday morning, I sat in the administration building, and I looked out a window at the president's house all night to make sure nobody bothered it. And I remember one shift, it was like two or three in the morning, it was cold, I was tired, and I asked myself, why am I doing this? 
And that was the first of many times I would ask myself that question as an adult. I, when I first started in ministry and was in seminary, Michelle and I were newly married. We were on different school schedules, and I asked myself, why am I doing this? I was taking a, a course called Clinical Pastoral Education. I was a chaplain at Sinai Hospital, and I had just been sent to visit the room of a rabbi who had heart surgery, and I remember it vividly because he just tore me up one side and down the other while I was a Christian visiting Jewish people. I was committing spiritual holocaust, and I left that room. Why am I doing this? I was getting my doctorate, serving full-time here, reading and writing constantly, burning the candle at both ends, attending classes. Why am I doing this? Every time I run a marathon, about mile 20 to 22, why am I doing this? And I would love to be able to tell you that each time I asked myself that question, I got an immediate answer, I got an affirming answer. I wish I could tell you that, but I can't. I can tell you, however, if you ever find yourself asking this question, you're not alone. The one question that has stood the test of time. And let's look back at that first Palm Sunday. Hours before Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem, he's walking from Bethphage and Bethany near the Mount of Olives, and he just kind of slows down and he stops and he looks at his disciples and he says, go into the village ahead of you. And immediately as you enter it, you will find there a colt that has never been ridden. Untie it and bring it. If anyone says to you, why are you doing this? Just say this, the Lord needs it, and we'll send it back here immediately. They went away and found a colt tied near a door outside in the street. As they were untying it, some of the bystanders said to them, why are you doing, what are you doing untying the colt? They told them what Jesus had said, and they allowed them to take it. Now, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, all three of them describe these two unnamed disciples who were sent ahead to secure this colt so that Jesus could ride it in. It was apparently an easy task. It was simple. They went in. They found the colt. They untied it. Done. Now, of course, this mundane task of cult wrangling was made a little more special by Jesus' prediction. I mean, he tells them ahead of time where the two would find the cult, what someone would say to them when they caught them untying the cult, and what they would say back. But still, there's just this level of where it's just an everyday, ordinary task. Nothing really special about it. But still, they were confronted with that question, why are you doing this? I mean, imagine years later, the disciples trying to explain their cult wrangling ministry. I mean, sure, Peter walked on water, but we got Jesus the cult. Okay, so maybe they weren't that excited. They weren't even named. That's how excited they were to be a part of the story. Just leave our names out of it, they said. So why bother including this in the gospel? Why spend over half of this passage describing the details of this mundane task about acquiring the animal, where to find it, what kind of cult to seek, what to do, what to say? I mean, it has to be more than just filler. The, the gospel writers weren't paid by the word. But then imagine all that the disciples had seen. They watched as Jesus took five loaves and two fish and fed 5,000 people. They saw him walk on water. They heard him deliver the Sermon on the Mount. They even just saw him raise Lazarus from the dead. But with all of that, I'm still more amazed by this simple, mundane story. Because it reminds me that even in the mundane, ordinary tasks of everyday life, God can be encountered. I don't have to have the miracle in order to experience God. Jesus sends them to get a colt, and by predicting the encounter that the disciples would have, Jesus turns that event into a moment of revelation. The appearance of the person questioning them, as Jesus had predicted, is an affirmation that God's work was going on around them, even in the midst of this mundane task. 
I mean, we even know we're getting ready to, to celebrate it on Thursday. Jesus asked himself the same question in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not quite the same way, but pretty much while he was praying in the garden, he was asking, why am I doing this? But even as you look at that triumphal entry, Mark's version is pretty anticlimactic. I mean, there's all the excitement of the parade, the, the people shouting, waving palms, laying down their coats. Jesus says nothing throughout it all. He walks into the temple, he looks around, turns back around and heads back to Bethany. Pretty anticlimactic, nothing happened. But when the two were asked, why are they, you doing this? Their response was to describe what Jesus had predicted. And the disciples were once again reminded about Jesus' activity in their lives. So I guess for us, the, the question also remains, what does this have to do with us? How does this help us answer the question, why am I doing this? How does this give us direction? How does this give us purpose? How does this show us God? Well, by turning this mundane and ordinary task into something special, into an encounter with the divine, I believe we're reminded that even in the mundane tasks, God is present. As we put our hands to work in the everyday humdrum of life, in the challenges that stretch us, and in the moments that wear us down, I believe we can encounter God's presence and be taught by God's love. I mean, every time I have uttered the question, why am I doing this? I'm eventually, eventually I learn something about either myself or about another person or about God. And tasks that may seem ordinary and at times maybe even dull and boring might be an opportunity to encounter God. The great American preacher and activist Martin Luther King Jr. once declared, if a man is called to be a street sweeper, he should sweep streets even as Michelangelo painted or Beethoven composed music or Shakespeare wrote poetry. He should sweep streets so well that all the hosts of heaven and earth will pause to say, here lived a great street sweeper who did his job well. Jesus' entry into Jerusalem is filled with tension and excitement. Jesus is fulfilling a prophecy of the Hebrew scripture. His procession declares his identity. And Jesus, in this moment, sets his face towards the cross. And that same crowd that was shouting Hosanna at the beginning of the week will be the same crowd who shouts crucify him at the end of the week. People are fickle. And we who know the story, we know what's going to occur, we should also understand our place within the story. We are part of that crowd. And we are the cult wranglers. We wave our branches and we gather in hope. Yet as we do, we also know that despite our enthusiastic response, we will lose our way with Jesus. We will shout crucify him. We will desert we will betray, and we will hide. This is how we live our lives as a mixture of belief and skepticism with the ability to do both things that are good and things that are bad, and usually not even fully aware of the difference between the two. Yet we celebrate that God's love, we celebrate God's love, yet we also deny God's place in our lives. But knowing all of this, Jesus rides on. He rides on towards the cross. He rides on towards his death. He rides on towards the resurrection to break through our fickleness and declare God's love for us and our inclusion in God's life. The hope that we find in the story of the cult wranglers and in Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, the hope we find every time we ask ourselves, why am I doing this? The hope we find is the knowledge that Jesus at times is riding ahead of us and at other times riding beside us, but most of the time riding behind us, nudging us along the way. And Jesus is with us as we go through our everyday ordinary mundane tasks as we gather here together to celebrate not because we're worthy but because he chooses to be with us out of love let us pray
gracious and loving God, in the journey of life, you are our guide and our companion. From our beginning to our end, you are there. You run this race along us, at times encouraging us, at times comforting us, at times tending to our wounds, at times carrying us when we don't think we can take another step. For six weeks, we've been on a Lenten journey, and you've been right here with us in our discipline and devotion, in our weakness and failure, in our fear and in our hope. As he confronts those who challenge him, He confronts our own stubbornness and defiant wills. As he cares even for those who hate him, we are challenged to love as he loves. As he bears witness to the emergence of your kingdom, our eyes are open to your presence all around us. As he moves with resolve toward his dark destiny, we find ourselves struggling to understand why it has to be this way. God, the journey is not just about the destination. It's about each step along the way. The journey itself is a blessing with all of its joys and sorrows. As we run this race, you are shaping us into new people. As we move with you, we are continually born anew. Help us to be attentive to each step, in the darkness and in the light. Help us to fully experience all that we encounter, the good and the bad, for in it all we discover you. Though the race of life goes on, our Lenten journey is nearing its conclusion. Bind us ever closer to Christ, so that we may, we may turn our hearts and minds to all that he experienced in the crucible of this holy week, a week both terrible and wonderful. Amen.